Well, good morning, everyone. It is indeed a joy to be back here and share with you from the Word of God. Looking forward to the conference. Looking forward to hearing from Brother Micah. I've heard a lot about him, but I've never actually heard him. So I'm kind of in for a treat as well from what I've heard. So looking forward very much to laboring together in the Word of God. This morning, uh, as I was reading in my devotions, I I read uh, from Psalm 149. And verse 6 just really jumped out at the page at me and kind of uh, reminded me of why we're here this weekend. It says in Psalm 149, verse 6, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. We're going to do a lot of singing. And the high praises of God will be in our mouths. And then it says, And a two-edged sword in their hand. And the Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword. So if you get cut this weekend by the Word of God, don't blame me. It's the Word of God that does that. But I want us to please, if you can turn with me in your Bibles, to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles and chapter 34. 2 Chronicles 34. And I'm going to be spending uh, all weekend, really, on chapter 34 and chapter 35 of 2 Chronicles. And we're going to be looking at lessons from the life of Josiah, king of Judah. Lessons that I hope will have practical significance for you and I. And one of the things that I want to speak about, particularly as it pertains to this, we'll we'll give more detail as we go, but I want to just ask the question, is a last day's revival possible? Okay? That's kind of the back of my mind as I think about these portions of Scripture. But anyway, for the sake of reading, let's read the first seven verses of 2 Chronicles chapter 34. It says this, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above. Then he cut down, them he cut down, and the groves and the carved images and the molten images he break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even unto Naphtali, with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. And God indeed will add a blessing to his precious word to us this evening. Now, I want to just mention some other key passages that have a bearing on the life of King Josiah. So 2 Kings chapters 22 and 23 kind of are parallel passages to this. We, we, we may look at them at some point, uh, not just now, uh, but there are other portions that relate to the life of King Josiah. Also, Jeremiah the prophet and the first 12 chapters were during the reign of godly King Josiah. So there's perhaps some influence there from Jeremiah's ministry. And then Zephaniah chapters 1 through 3, one of the minor prophets, also has a play in the life and influence of Josiah. So why would we speak on a subject like this at a conference uh, like this this weekend? Well, Josiah lived at a very dark time in the nation of Judah's history. In fact, the sword of divine judgment, which has long been held back on Judah uh, because of his patience and his long-suffering with the nation, had already been pronounced as a result of the wickedness 
of Josiah's grandfather, uh, the king Manasseh, it was determined that Israel were going to go in, or Judah were going to go into captivity. So, so judgment has already been announced. It was just a matter of time before it fell. In fact, if you turn with me, please, to 2 Kings, I want to uh, show you that pronouncement of judgment that had already been made. It was evident judgment was coming. 2 Kings 21, we're going to read from verse 10 down to verse 16. It says, the Lord spake by his servants, the prophets, saying, because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did. Let me just pause there. It was, he had actually been more wicked than the Canaanites and the Amorites who the Israelites were supposed to drive out of the land. So when God's people actually out sin the pagans, you know you've got a problem. And Manasseh did that. And so it says, uh, which was before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies, because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt. Even to this day, moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the judgment is pronounced. Judah is going to be wiped like a pan, turned over. In other words, it's going into captivity. It's going to be desolate. It's, uh, this is the pronouncement of the prophets of God, and it's going to come. And so Josiah is crowned as king, with this kind of ominous judgment looming over his kingdom. Uh, that's hardly the most exciting way to start as a king, isn't it? Knowing that it's just, it's just a matter of time before judgment falls. And it's certainly it's because of this king Manasseh, his grandfather, who without question was the most evil king in the whole of Judah's history. As we said, out sinning, the pagans that God had decreed to be cast out of the land because of their wickedness, and he did more wickedly. And God is no respecter of persons. Uh, in other words, if he's going to do that to the Canaanites, if his people do the same things, he's going to do it to them. He's not a respecter of persons. And so the judgment is pronounced. And it's a tragic thing, isn't it, when God's people are more wicked than the infidels, the unbelieving world around them, when they actually out-sin the, uh, the people of the land in which they live. You know you're in deep trouble. The tragedy of King Manasseh was that he had a godly father, Hezekiah, a man who had been instrumental in a great revival himself. And Manasseh was born during those extra 15 years, if you remember that uh, uh, King Hezekiah was uh, sick unto death, and he prayed, and the Lord granted him an extra 15 years, and in the extra 15 years, he had a little boy called, Hezekiah, uh, called Manasseh, who turned out to be this wicked king. And it was a tragic thing, really, because he, he grew up with great advantages of seeing the blessing of revival. He, he witnessed some of the effects of that, and yet he rebelled against his father, rebelled against his father's God, and indulged in the grossest idolatry, including, and this is how bad they were, uh, there was, a, there was a, a wicked pagan deity called Moloch. In Moloch, they, it, was, it was a brass image that was hollow, and they would light a fire under it. They would, they would set it on fire till, till the brass image glowed red, and they would offer their children by putting them into the arms of Moloch, and Manasseh offered one of his sons to Moloch. I mean, amazing, shattering to think about these things. And this is 
a man who grew up with a godly father, and yet he was so idolatrous. He even set up idols in the very temple of God in Jerusalem. And how did all this happen? Well, it happened, and it always happens when people neglect and stand in defiance of the word of God. And that's exactly what happened. And, and so the, he was captivated by the idols of the world and all that the world was doing. He felt like he was missing out somehow. And he got involved in all that stuff and he neglected and defied God's word. But God has his way of dealing with prodigals. And Manasseh was humbled, so much so that he actually repented. Look at Second Chronicles 33 and verse 12 and 13. The most wicked king actually repented. It says, and when he was in affliction, after God's chastening hand had been upon him, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem, to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. And that, I guess, even though it's a kind of a sad story, the story of King Manasseh, it's a story that's got a note of hope. That somebody could rebel to such a degree of wickedness, and yet if they would just repent, they could actually be restored in a measure. And he was restored, and actually he, he made diligent efforts to try to uh, make amends for the wicked things he had done. Uh, and um, tragically, uh, despite trying to make amends, trying to clear up some of the idolatry that he had, uh, he had uh, kind of decorated Jerusalem with, uh, the tragic thing was that his son, Ammon, who was the father of Josiah, instead of looking at his father's repentance and brokenness and saying, I'm going to model myself on my new dad, this new man that's been transformed, he modeled himself on Manasseh's wickedness. And Ammon became an evil, wicked king as well. And so <clears throat> notice in chapter 33, we're just laying a foundation here, uh, chapter 33 and verse 23, we read this. It says, and speaking of Ammon, and he humbled not himself before the Lord as Manasseh his father had humbled himself but Ammon trespassed more and more. And the result was, it says, his own servants conspired against him and slew him in his own house. And so only uh, two years into his reign, he set off in the wicked ways of his father at the first and uh, didn't humble himself like his father did. And he was murdered by his own servants. So you might ask yourself, well, what's this got to do with you and I in 2022 um, at this conference? I mean, does it have any bearing on us? Well, it does. I believe that our own nation and the nations of this world are ripe for divine judgment. The, the wickedness in our society is going up to God every single day, and there comes a day when God is going to say, enough is enough, and he's going to judge and we know that. The book of Revelation tells us that there are judgments coming to planet Earth. Uh, if we think of even this nation alone, just think about it for a moment. Uh, we think about them offering their babies in the days of Judah to Molech and putting them on this brazen bull. But in this country, 60 million babies have been murdered for what? so that their parents can pursue the American dream. Isn't that the same thing? 60 million. That's bigger than some countries of babies that have just been wiped out before they even took their first breath. This is evil. This is, this is America the beautiful, right? That's not very beautiful. That is sin of the highest kind so that we can pursue our selfish ends and selfish ambitions. And sadly, the church which ought to be the bright light in this world, is often not very different. We watch the same movies, we live for the same goals and ambitions, and we're even guilty of the same sins. Uh, years ago, I read an article. It was 
uh, I think in uh, Los Angeles Times, if I'm not mistaken, and a guy was writing an article and he was telling Christians to stop preaching at him because he said that there'd been a major study and they'd found that divorce rate amongst Christians was the same as everybody else in the population. Abortion rate was actually the same. Now, what, how he determined a Christian, I don't know. Uh, pornography use was the same. In other words, he said, you have no business lecturing me unless your life is significantly different. And tragically, often, the world is deaf to our message because they look at Christians and say, you're no different. And we've lost our moral authority and our moral high ground. And so <clears throat> the Bible says this, judgment must begin where? At the house of God, right? <laughs> and if the righteous scarcely be saved, what about the ungodly and the unrighteous? What's going to be their end? And so if I could put it this way, we're living in a very different world to the first conference in 19. In fact, I, I sometimes wonder what those brethren would think if they could kind of time travel and come back here and be at this conference this weekend and just see America, get a feel for it at right now. I wonder what they'd say to us. I, I wonder if those first preachers took the platform, what would their message be to us this week? It'd be interesting to think about that, right? Because I'll tell you the changes have occurred since 1911. And some of them have been good in terms of easier to live, you know, kind of all the conveniences. But spiritually, we ask the question, are we advancing over our fathers spiritually? Are we as vibrant as they were back then? Are we as excised about the gospel as they were back then? I mean, how do you think we're doing? I mean, just uh, you ask the questions yourself. I want you to, you to ask these questions, to think about these things. Uh, I think it's important that we do this. I think the brethren in 1911 could hardly imagine the wickedness of our day. I think they would have a hard time even conceiving of it. It would shock them. So Josiah lived in the late evening of Judah's history. Judgment has been pronounced. It's going to happen. And I believe that we're living in the late evening of the history of the church. I believe that that the coming, we often say it, the coming of the Lord draws near, but I, I believe it, it's so close. It says, you know, the day of the Lord is at hand. It's so close you can almost touch it. It's so close. And so my question is this. Is it possible that there could be one last revival before judgment falls? Is, is that a possibility? Is it something we should even consider or even think about? Because when you look at Josiah... I suppose he could have just resigned himself to the idea, well, judgment's coming, what's the point? You know, just kind of hold on for the ride and wait for it to come. But Josiah didn't. And God granted him an amazing revival. In fact, such an amazing revival that we'll see later on, they had the most amazing Passover in the history of the nation before judgment fell. Isn't that encouraging? I mean, I look at this and say, Oh, I know I've got to paint a black picture. You know, you've got, to, you've got to put the black velvet there before you're going to see the diamond. So I had to do all that stuff. Forgive me if that was kind of depressing for you, but it's reality. It's the way it is, but it's not hopeless. I want you to see it is not hopeless. And so despite judgment pronounced, one last revival was given to Judah before the inevitable happened. Even though the hour was late, Josiah didn't give up in hopeless resignation. He didn't say we're living in the last days of Judah's history, so just grin and bear it. In fact, it tells us that he sought the Lord. He sought the Lord. And we're going to see that God heard his entreaties and God blessed this, this eight-year-old boy and blessed him incredibly with a phenomenal revival. So could we even entertain that possibility? Let me tell you why we could. You know, in the tribulation period that is coming, in Revelation chapter 7, which is clearly talking about in the tribulation, after the church has been snatched away, and so the testimony of the church is over, and we're in that tribulation period, God is going to bring a revival. Look at verse 9. Of Revelation 7, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, 
clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne, and to the Lamb. And then look at verse 13. It says, One of the elders answered and saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said to him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which come out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of of the Lamb. Now, isn't that fantastic? That, that in the darkest period of human history, that seven-year tribulation period after the church is raptured, before Jesus comes to the earth uh, in glory, it, it's gonna, it, it tells us that that period, the Lord himself said, there's never been a time like it in human history and there won't be a time after. It's going to be the worst case scenario for planet earth. And yet in the midst of that, the greatest in gathering of souls you could imagine. Because one of the things the Bible tells me about God is this, in wrath, he remembers mercy. And so there's a great in gathering. Now, if there's a great in gathering in the tribulation period, is it possible that there could be a great in gathering prior to the rapture of the church? Is that a possibility? And why should we even think that or maybe expect that? Well, because we know a little bit about our God. I hope we know a bit about our God. And one of the things about God is that before a disaster seems to come on the earth, prior to that, there seems to be an outpouring, a special outpouring of mercy. So let me give you some historical facts. 1857, there was an event called the Businessman's Prayer Revival. It started in New York City in Fulton Street with a group of guys burdened about the state of America, its secular uh, state of things, and they began to meet to pray. And it resulted in a revival that swept across this land and multitudes being saved. And guess what happened when they all got saved? The amazing thing was that after that, in 1862, something happened in this country. What was it? Civil War. A lot of those men who died in the Civil War, was saved in the 1857, 1858, 1859 revival. Amazing, right? That's, that's God's mercy. 1904, the Welsh revival started in Wales, but it covered the globe. It affected places like China, Manchuria, Korea, even North Korea, Pyongyang, amazing places. All that revival occurred prior to the First World War. Is that, is that just kind of accidental, or is it... God in mercy saving multitudes before he brings a great calamity on the earth. 1926, there were amazing revivals in the British Isles prior to the outbreak of the Second World War. The Forgotten Revival in Great Yarmouth and northeast coast of Scotland and in Northern Ireland under W.P. Nicholson. And even in this country, in the 60s, anybody ever heard of this Jesus movement when all these weirdo hippies got saved? Anybody ever heard of Maybe there's some here. I know there's at least one here who was one of those weirdo hippies. And why was all that? Because Vietnam was looming its ugly head. And there was an amazing ingathering of souls. See, this is God. God is gracious and merciful. And he's able to save even in these dark days in North America. I was talking to a dear brother recently. He was telling me that for 10 years, he's done a state fair in upstate New York, hardly the most Christian-friendly place on this continent. And he told me, he said, this, this last year, he said, I've never seen anything like it. He said, we weren't going to get to talk to people. People were coming to talk to us, and they were asking us, what is happening in our world? You see, covid You see Ukraine and the conflict going on there. You see what's happening in our supermarkets. You know, like I was in the peanut butter aisle the other day. It's almost empty. Like I remember being in Bulgaria back in the 80s and going in a a store and seeing empty shelves. I've never seen them in North America, but I see them now. Incredible. What's going on? And people are seeing it. People, thinking people in this world are saying, what is happening? And if ever we had an an opportunity to give an answer 
for the hope that's within us, it is right now, folks. If you're not an evangelist, do the work of an evangelist. This is the time to tell people that they can have their filthy robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. They can be made clean by believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross as their Savior. If they'll just humble themselves and trust in His finished work, they can be saved. And God is working, but He can do a lot more if we follow Josiah's example. And so what I'm hoping is that if you're one of the folks that has just got that mentality, well, uh, it, it's just going to be a rough ride, white knuckle ride. Let's hold on until the rapture. Just watch it decline. If that's what you're thinking, Josiah is going to rebuke you because Josiah would have none of that. Even though doom is pronounced, Josiah said, I'm not going that way. It may be pronounced, but I'm not going to follow that suit. Now notice uh, back in our chapter 34, and we, we, we're just going to learn a few things about him. Uh, notice verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. That's, even that is a mark of the judgment of God on the nation, that an eight-year-old was the king. Because Isaiah, the prophet, tells us in Isaiah chapter 3, in verse 4, he, he said, one of the evidences of divine judgment already seen on a nation. It says, I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. So already it's a mark of divine judgment. You have a babe ruling in the nation. Ecclesiastes 10, 16 says, Woe unto thee, O land, when thy king is a child. Wow, isn't that something? When your king's a child. The tragedy of our day is we have adults who are still children. They're adult children. Childishness characterized them. Not in the good sense. You know, the Lord says to get saved, you have to become like a little child. There's a good sense of being childlike, right? A simplicity, a simple faith and trust. But on the other hand, there are adults that are behaving like babies or children. They've never grown. And they're raising children. Children, adult children, raising children. It's a disaster, isn't it? I, I went to a high school reunion a few years ago in England, and um, none of the guys, I got saved at, uh, just before my 21st birthday, so the last they saw of me was the old Mike Catwood who you wouldn't want to listen to, right? Very different individual. And that was the last they'd seen of me. And so we end up there, and of course, they're all buying drinks. Of course, it's got to be in a pub. And so what do you want to drink? I'll have an apple juice. And they're looking, well, what's wrong with you? You know, I mean, they, they remember the old guy. But what was interesting is all my mates were still dressed in the same gear that they wore when they were 17 and 18. They were still listening to the same music they listened to when they were 17 and 18 and still riding around on the same motor scooters. We used to be a group of mods that used to ride around on, on these Lambrettas. And they were still doing it. It's like, it's like a time warp except their bodies were saying they're 50 and 60 and yet they're still dressed like they're 17 and 18 and pretending they're 17 and 18. Isn't that staggering? It's like they never moved on. They're stuck in, and yet they've had families and marriages. Many of them are broken down because their wives realize I'm married to a kid. It's tragic. Folks, this is, this is our world. Children who have never grown up, never taken responsibility, never taken on adult responsibility. I was talking to somebody recently. They're concerned about godly husbands for their daughters. I, I meet many girls. I mean, I could start a dating agency if I could just find the guys, godly girls who are looking for spiritual men that are not still gaming at 35 years of age, that are not still wasting hours doing nothing of any consequence. And they say, where are the godly men? Where are they? This is, this is our day, folks. We're ripe for judgment. And yet, God in mercy would use this child king in a remarkable way. He had mercy on both the child and the nation. His name means given of Jehovah. And if ever there was a gift to the nation, when judgment is about to be pronounced, here is this gift to the nation from God at a critical time in its history. How good is the Lord to send Josiah after the terrible disaster of Manasseh, and Ammon, and God in grace, sends a new administration that has an ounce of sense, <laughs> that, that's not 
filled with folly like the previous administrations. But it all starts with an eight-year-old. Now, this is a challenge, isn't it? It shows the value of investing our lives into the young. Somebody, somewhere, had had some kind of influence on this eight-year-old boy that he didn't just follow in the ways of his father and his grandfather, right? Something changes here. There's some godly influence. There's something going on here. And, and can we challenge one another? I, I have five grandkids now. That's a, that's a, a, a solemn responsibility. I'm, I'm thank, I thank God for technology. They live on another country. They live in Norway, but we can invest in them. We can pour the scriptures into them over FaceTime. What a privilege. And how we need to invest in these little eight-year-olds. Who knows if it's going to be another Josiah, you see? So we need to think about this. And thank God for evangelistic Sunday schools, reaching souls while they're young and tender with the gospel. Pray for this work. Pray for the work amongst children. Because somebody managed to have a positive influence for good in this young boy's life. And we are going to see some of those influences in a moment. Notice what it says in verse 2. It, says, it tells us how long he reigned. He reigned uh, to be uh, for 31 years, so he died age 39. Interesting, isn't it, that he died age 39. And, and I'm sure he had, if somebody had told him, you're, you're going to die at 39, he would never have guessed it. And that's the thing. None of us know when our day to meet the Lord is going to be. We, we don't know. And, and so the one thing about him, he had a short life, but I'll tell you, it was lived for God. Undeviatingly lived for God. And so I don't know how long I've got left, but I, I, I want to be sure that every day is lived for him because we're not sure when it's going to end, but we want to be living full throttle for the Lord until our last breath. And that's the way we see with Josiah. Dies, dies 39 years of age, but nevertheless, that life was incredibly significant. It says in verse 2, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. He never deviated, not one bit. Now, what a contrast to the previous two kings. He does that which is right in the sight of the Lord. They seem to specialize in doing that which was abominable in the sight of the Lord. Yeah, he does that which is right in the sight of the Lord. <clears throat> and it's interesting, he didn't do that which was right in his own eyes. That's our culture. It's okay for you, but this is for me, you see. Everybody does that which is right. It's like the book of Judges, right? Everyone does that which is right in their own eyes. He didn't do that which is right in his own eyes, as the days of Judges. He didn't do that which was right in the eyes of the people, as in the Laodicean age, where many churches are governed by what the people want rather than what the Lord wants. No, he's not a Judges man, and he's not a Laodicean man. Nor was he doing what was right in the eyes of his predecessors, following the traditions of his father and his grandfather. No, he said, I'm not a tradition boy either. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk in such a way that I do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, what, a, what an example for all of us. Is what we're doing right in the eyes of the Lord? And what's interesting is the Lord, the eyes of the Lord are looking, scanning the whole earth, looking for somebody whose ways are perfect before him. And so here's Josiah. He's doing right, what's right in the eyes of the Lord. And the eyes of the Lord are looking for such a man, still looking today. Are you going to walk in his ways? The eyes of the Lord are looking. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9 tells us that. Every good king in Judah is said to have walked in the ways of David, his father. King Aser, King Jehoshaphat, King Hezekiah, and now King Josiah. It always has the same mantra concerning them. And it always says that they did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David, his father. <clears throat> Some of them started well, but they didn't end so well. But with Josiah, it says he declined neither to the right hand or to the left. I love that. And again, these people didn't just say these things. There were biblical purposes behind these statements. Look at Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17, and we'll look at verse 20. Speaking of the king, just to show you from verse 15, thou shalt in any wise set him a king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. But one from among thy brethren shall thou set king over thee, that thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. So the king had to be from the children of Israel. And then 
Verse 19, it shall be with him. He shall read therein in the law of God all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of his, this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So this idea of undeviating, not going to the left or to the right, but following the Lord in a straight path. Isn't that beautiful? What a challenge. Because isn't it easy to be swayed to the left or to the right rather than to be directly following the Lord, keeping a straight course. It's so needed. And it's easy for us to swing from progressiveness on one side and become too progressive and move away from the Word of God, or we can become too legalistic on the other side and add to the Word of God things that have no business being there and to actually follow the Lord in a straight path. Boy, that's a hard thing. I find that when you're in the middle of the road, you get it from both sides. Some places I go and they say I'm a rabid legalist. In other places I go, they say I'm liberal. So I must be doing something right to get it from both sides, right? I think that's the idea is that we're supposed to walk following the Lord. Follow me as I follow Christ. Now, I don't know whether you allow guns up here, but we love guns in Missouri. And guns, you have two sights, right? You got a near one and a far one. If you line them up, you're going to hit bullseye every time. Follow me as I follow Christ. If I'm not following Christ, you don't follow because you're going to miss the target. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's the way we're to live, undeviating, not to the left, not to the right. And that's how he lived. That's Josiah's life. How did Josiah go against the current age? What were these influences upon his life, especially in those tender formative years? This, this early evidence of piety shows that there's some influences here. So we want to think about these influences. We'll start with uh, some suggestions. One is his mother, Jedediah. Uh, we read about her in Second Kings. And it might actually be a good thing if you put your Bible ribbon or marker or whatever piece of paper, even the, uh, the schedule for the conference or whatever, uh, stick it in Second Kings 22 because we might be going back and forth a little bit with these passages. Verse 1 says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jedediah, the daughter of Adiah of Bosketh. So all we know about this woman is her name, Jedediah, means beloved. It's nice to have a wife who's beloved, isn't it? So she was called beloved Ammon, this wicked king, but he had a beloved wife who was the mother of Josiah. <clears throat> She's beloved. She's the daughter of Adiah of Boscoth. And Adiah means pleasing to God. Could this be the source of influencing on his life? I mean, how many lives have been influenced by a godly mother? Incredible. Timothy, right? Young Timothy. The father's out of the picture. He's a dud. But godly mother, godly grandmother, and here's Timothy. No man quite like Timothy. Oh, the influence of a godly mother. Uh, amazing. Uh, I could tell you so many stories of, of famous preachers who had drunken fathers and godly mothers. John Newton, remember that guy? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wherever he went in the world, on these slave ships, living a life of debauchery, he said he could never get away from his mother's prayers. Isn't that amazing? Those John and Charles Wesley. What, how did they turn out so well? Because the father, Samuel, he was constantly in trouble with debt. He couldn't manage finances. He was, he, was a, he was a bit of a loser. But Susanna was a woman of God, and she poured her life into those little boys, and as a result of it, saved the nation from revolution through the preaching of John and Charles Wesley. Oh, thank God. It's, I know it's not Mother's Day, but every day, thank God for godly mothers, and for the prayers of godly mothers. Even if you have children that are right now wayward, they will never get away from your prayers. Let's never lose hope and pray for these. So it could be that this is the source of influence. You wonder, how did she ever marry a wretch like Ammon? <laughs> like, what are some of these women? Th like Abigail. How did Abigail? I mean, to me, she's one of the most wonderful people in the whole of the Old Testament, and she marries a fool called Nabal. 
How do they do this? I have no idea. But God in his grace somehow manages to bring something good out of it all. And so <clears throat> our time is gone. We don't want to, we still want to look at some other influences. I want to think about Zephaniah and Jeremiah. And then we're going to look at his ministry. This t- session, we've been thinking about the purpose of Josiah. And the purpose was really simple. And it's a purpose that we should commit ourselves to. And it is despite discouragement, seek the Lord. That's what this man did. May God encourage us. Despite discouraging days, let us covenant to seek the Lord together, that in wrath he will remember mercy and send a revival first of the people of God, because revival is for the church. It it means life again. It assumes there's life there, but it's kind of at a low ebb. Revival amongst the church, awakening amongst the lost. Because you see, when a church is revived, the church loses its excuse. It can't say anymore, don't preach to me because your life is no different. Because when the church is revived, their lives are very different. And they're ready to listen because they know you're not fake. (laughs) You're the real deal. And they will pay attention because they see this revived life. So let's trust the Lord that he might do these things. Let's just quickly pray.